The International Energy Agency released its Renewables Report 2021 yesterday, and I'm going to talk to Hemi Bahar, who is an analyst for IEA, he joins us from Paris. So well, uh, good morning, Hemi. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here again. So, Hemi, let's start with uh, an overview of the report, if you don't mind. Of course. Uh, so the big news uh, about the report is that um, despite uh, the challenges concerning the high commodity prices, uh, logistics, and also a reviving pandemic situation, we see uh, renewable capacity additions to break another record in 2021. I would like to take you to our last conversation one year ago, around one year ago. Uh, we were expecting an exceptional growth at the time for 2020, and our main headline was renewables defy pandemic uh, to have the highest growth. Uh, uh, but now we see that this growth is repeated, and we see another record year in 2021. And um, for the coming five years towards 2026, we expect renewable capacity to grow by 60 percent or 4,800 gigawatts. Uh, just to give you the scale, this equals uh, this will be equal at the end of the forecast period. Uh, the total capacity of renewables, which is uh, almost 5,000, let's say, will be much higher than coal, natural gas, and nuclear combined. And uh, this growth is uh, driven by two things. The first one is policies. We saw improved policies leading to COP. At COP is something else, but we are analyzing them leading to COP. So it was a big uh, improvement. Countries announced better policies, more ambitious plans, implementation policies first. The second one, uh, we saw that uh, Several uh, challenges that we saw last year were uh, handled, such as uncertain auction schemes, which were clarified, new targets, new technology-specific policies that were introduced all around the world. So that's why we revised up our forecast and see this uh, uh, big growth in the coming five years. What percentage of uh, global electricity production will renewables account for by the end of the forecast period in 2026? So by 2026, we expect uh, renewables to account for about 36, 37 percent of the entire power system, which means that they will become the largest source of uh, generation uh, towards 2026, which is very good news, surpassing coal. But the interesting thing is that most of this growth in the generation will be led by wind and solar PV. And by the end of the forecast, we will see the share of wind and PV, which we call them variable sources, to double and reach uh, 18% uh, just in five years from 9%, So, which is an important increase, obviously brings additional challenges in some parts of the world. Now, I understand that the uh, regardless of the rapid growth between now and 2026, the pace of growth is still not high enough to get us to net zero by 2050. This is a very uh, excellent question. And then we highlight this uh, more and more after our uh, publication of net zero by 2050 last May. The pace of growth is accelerating. It could accelerate even more uh, in our accelerated case, as we mentioned, 25% uh, more if governments address current challenges concerning policies or uh, grid integration or financing. But this is not enough. Uh, I think uh, COP26 uh, or 1.50 ambitions require a gear change uh, in addition to those, and uh, which means uh, it requires countries to increase their policy ambition. So targets is one thing, which is very good, but the policy ambition that will lead countries to those targets is even more important. So um, we need a gear change uh, if we want to go towards the net zero, and the report highlights this very well uh, and says that it, the growth rate needs to double for electricity in order to reach the, the targets. Now, which countries uh, or which regions uh, need to adjust policy more than others? I mean, Europe has been a leader in this. China is the is the uh, adds more renewables every year than any other uh, country. 
Uh, what about uh, the United States? What about uh, oh, Africa, Latin America? Where where are those regions at? So if we if we look at um, uh, our forecast versus net zero, every single country has to accelerate, no question. Uh, but uh, in terms of the uh, where uh, there is much potential, uh, is obviously there are few countries in the world that there are policies pending. There is incredible potential. There are certain policies being discussed over the last three, four months. The cost situation is very good concerning they are competitive with other fuels. The United States will be a good one. There is a strong policy right now. Uh, there was an extension of uh, tax credits, but there is a lot of discussion of a major policy improvement, which we did not include in our main case because it's still under discussion. For instance, it will really tilt the point and we will probably revise up significantly the forecast if this direct payment measure in the United States instead of tax credits are passed, which will make a huge difference. So we will include this probably this year if it is it was passed. Uh, another uh, country that is important is India. Uh, India is one of the fastest paced among major economies that we see in our forecast, but considering the size of India, the potential and the country's targets, uh, there is an incredible room for a faster growth, which is uh, which will happen in our opinion in the coming years with the policy improvements. But also in countries where there are still a lot of policy uncertainties with great potential, such as Southeast Asia, uh, there is incredible potential, very small growth compared to where they are. And I would like to finish with Africa, uh, because I mean Africa has an opportunity to leapfrog on renewables. Uh, but obviously the financing remains a big challenge. Grid infrastructure remains a big challenge. If those are addressed and governments are willing to fuel their economy with renewables and leapfrog on them, uh, Africa is ready, but these challenges need to be, need to be met. Amy, the, there's a lot of talk about the distributed uh, nature of renewables. And I, I guess the question I want to ask is how important is, especially for these countries like India and, and Africa, where there's uh, maybe the infrastructure is as, as well developed as in, say, China, Europe, United States, how imp what are the uh, opportunities for more, you know, for microgrids? for not having to rely on like the uh, a national grid development uh, in order to spur the growth of renewables? This is a, an excellent point. It's actually a trend that we see in these markets uh, in order to avoid uh, peak demand, uh, especially when there is a cooling demand during summer, uh, these countries go towards uh, the distributed solar PV because they have the potential. And the distributed solar PV provides this amazing opportunity to those countries to uh, avoid investing early on for the grid infrastructure, uh, because this reduces the peak, especially during the summer. But also it is important to mention that distribution grid may also be weak in these countries and can be a bottleneck itself. So there is this two sides of the story that we are looking at here. Uh, and uh, But policies are there. Uh, another important challenge is financing uh, because individual decisions, despite policy improvements, in the end, it's an individual decision, whether you want to use that money, invest in a solar PV or something else, the same thing for small companies is an important uh, yet uh, thing that we try to estimate how much growth will happen in these things. Now, we saw at COP26 that uh, Mark Carney and the, the Global uh, Net Zero Financing Group uh, said there's lots of capital. Uh, we're coming to the table. Uh, do you anticipate that those kinds of announcements are going to overcome the, uh, you know, during your forecast period, uh, make a considerable improvement on the access to capital to finance uh, some of the, uh, the renewables additions? We saw an incredible momentum at COP about the private sector. So leaving all these discussions about wording of the agreement aside, I think one of the big achievements is that uh, we have a lot of private sector uh, genuinely uh, involved, including financing sector, uh, the companies who wants to buy uh, green power or others. 
are genuinely uh, uh, in action uh, to do so. However, even if the money is there, for that money to be channeled into these, especially developing countries, governments need to play the policy role. So if governments cannot provide a stable policy, that capital will not go towards that direction. This is for both developing countries, but also the developed countries. I mean, one of the biggest challenge in Europe uh, to, to expand renewables is the permitting. Uh, it takes uh, five to nine years to get a permit for an onshore wind plant in Europe. Imagine how you can increase the pace with even with a lot of money. So, um, and there are in many parts of the world, we have this issue of how we do the permitting streamlined enough, but have the concerns about their sustainability uh, to, to build a basically and more, uh, which is needed to achieve long-term goals. Now, Hamey, over the last 10 years, we've seen remarkable uh, decline in the, you know, the cost curves for both solar and wind, and, uh, and I guess battery storage as well. Uh, what do you foresee for the, uh, the next five years in terms of those costs? Are we going to see a leveling out or are we still going to see some reductions? So uh, if we had this conversation uh, eight months ago, I would have said, yes, we will see in the coming five years, continuous reduction. But uh, we have a very specific analysis this year in the report about commodity prices and uh, uh, transportation prices. Over the last, I would say six months compared to before pandemic, which is the normal price of these, uh, of these commodities, steel, aluminum, um, copper, uh, silicon, polysilicon for PV, uh, anything that you can imagine that are used are increased between 50 to 200%. On top of that, the freight prices increased by almost uh, five, six fold. Obviously renewables are not immune uh, uh, from these cost increases. So, we calculated that those critical metals plus transportation costs account for about 25% of the investment cost of solar PV and wind plants. Not only the turbine, not only the model, the entire plant. So we calculated this for the first time, which means that 50% increase or doubling, tripling of these materials has a big impact on it. So, we estimated that if these continue towards 2022, towards mid and towards the end of 2022, we will see 25 to 35% cost increase of wind and PV uh, investment costs, which is unforeseen, as you know, over the last uh, decades, maybe even two decades. So this will change the, a little bit the, the, the deflationary uh, uh, trend that we saw over the years. So we are going towards probably an inflationary pressure uh, for renewables as well, which means that we will see the costs increasing in the coming two, three years, and maybe coming back down afterwards towards the same trajectory if the costs uh, go down. But um, we see the trend a bit differently after this big market change. And uh, we calculated that if the commodity prices remain high through 2022, we will see for the same capacity that we want to install a hundred billion additional investment in the coming two, three years, which means a one third of the, of the overall renewables investment, which is not small actually. Hamy, have we reached the point where wind and solar now, I mean, they are the, the least cost, uh, uh, the lowest cost way to generate electricity. And if I remember the Lazard uh, levelized cost of energy estimates, wind and solar were both down around uh, at the low end, you know, 22 to $25 a, a megawatt hour. Uh, even if they just stayed where it was or rose a little bit, it's still significantly lower than say natural gas. Is it now a low enough cost that it doesn't matter that much if it goes any lower? It's really these other barriers, policy, access to capital, grid in, in issues, and so on that are the biggest constraint to the growth of, of renewables? 
Yeah, you are raising an, a very correct and right point. In one hand, uh, uh, we must uh, look at this, even if 25, 30% increase in cost of uh, wind and solar, they remain competitive for sure. In most parts of the world, uh, wind and solar PV utility scale plants are basically the lowest way of adding new generation to the system. In, uh, in a number of places and in an increasing number of places, I will say they are also cheaper than, uh, than existing power plants. Uh, when there is a CO2 price or when there is an increase in fossil fuel prices, especially when we see these extremely high natural gas prices, that is an important one. So that's why after this uh, huge increase in the commodity uh, prices, we see more and more companies contracting renewable plants, even if at a higher cost than they used to be. The reason behind this is very simple. It's cheaper, but more importantly, you don't expose yourself into volatile fossil fuel prices. You have a fixed contract for five, 10, 15 years at least, you know how much you're going to pay, you are not exposed to this. So in that sense, uh, renewables still offer a cheapest way of generating, but you are also right that we need to think about the other ways that are storage, integration, building more grids to connect renewables and so on and so forth. Those cost money. Uh, and I think the government policies should basically uh, work on uh, not subsidizing renewables anymore, but enabling their uh, faster expansion. Amy, uh, valuable insights as always. Thank you very much for this. Thank you very much.